is Joy News Prime. This is Joy News Prime here on Joy News on Multi TV, but also available across Europe on ABN Television. Coming up, residents of Komenda in the central region left terrified after two persons sustained gunshot wounds in a chief city clash in the town. And in business, cocoa farmers to get 21 percent more for their produce after government announced an upward review in the producer price. And what's the case with Ghana's European loan? We'll tell you. Stay tuned for all those details with Abigail Adomako entry when business comes up in 30 minutes. Now, very first story, dozens of residents have fled the town of Komenda in the central region following a clash between factions and the chief city disputes there. Two persons are said to have sustained gunshot wounds in the incident. As a result, those who remain in the town are unable to leave their homes, even to go to their farms for fear of being attacked. Central Regional Correspondent Richard Kodonyako has the rest of the story and joins me now over the telephone line to tell us more. Good evening to you, Richard. Good evening, Lisa. Right, to what extent is this fear that has gripped the town that some of the residents have had to flee? Well, um, this Kitensi dispute has lingered on for a very long period. Now there are two factions. Each of the factions want to uh, elect board chief. And so on that fateful Saturday, uh, one faction carried the chief, and the other faction also uh, tried to prevent him. the other faction from carrying uh, that chief uh, when they were celebrating the festival. So it led to a serious uh, clash, and the police intervened. So when after the police had intervened, there were reprisal attacks the following day, and it led to some gunshots, and two persons sustained some serious injuries. And as I speak with you now, uh, one person has, still has the bullet in the head and on, in the neck, and the other person has also been referred to the police in the hospital. Now, what has been the role of the police in all of this, and why are they unable to maintain peace in the town? Well, the police have been in, in touching the community, they go there and then they effect arrest of some of the residents they suspect were behind the clashes. And this has led to some fear that has gripped the entire uh, community. Most of them have fled. Uh, teachers and pupils can no longer cope. And so they have, uh, the teachers especially have deserted the community. They said that this place is no longer safe for them to live because they fear that they might also be as well. Uh, women in the town are unable to go to their farms because they fear that they might attack them for fear of being touched as coming from this person or that person. And so the police come there and then they effect their arrest and go there. But if they go back to the police station. But they have not been able to tell the press anything um, about this class. And that is the mystery surrounding this whole um, development. Are the residents telling you what it will take for them to come back, especially those who have fled the town? Well, the residents are calling on the police um, to intervene, to come to assure, that, uh, assure them that they are safe in that particular community. And they want the, uh, the Central Regional House of Peace to intervene and the National Assault because it has lingered on for a long period. And they want an amicable settlement so that there wouldn't be any more clashes in that particular community. Because they say that they are predominantly a farming community and all that they get is to go to the farm and then uh, they get some food stuff to feed themselves and their farms. And so this one, if this one continues to happen, then they, they wouldn't be longer, uh, they wouldn't feel safe in that particular community. I went to the uh, AEA uh, Municipal Education Directory and I spoke with them uh, municipal uh, director of education, and he told me that he was in touch with uh, the KEA chief executive, and they have they are mapping out that in order to ensure that the school um, um, comes back to session. Because for now, it was not um, the school was not closed down by the education director, but it was it was closed down uh, by itself following the teachers' absenteeism and the students' uh, unwillingness to go back. All right, thank you very much, uh, Richard Kojonyako. And Richard, Richard Kojonyako, our central region correspondent, was bringing us, has been bringing us up to speed on the situation in Komenda in the central region where a clash between two 
factions in the chief city dispute has got a number of the residents fleeing. And over to Kumasi, where investigative journalist Anas Rumey Anas has cancelled the Kumasi screening of his documentary on corruption in the judiciary. This follows a suit filed by hardcore judge Justice Peter Derry. One of those captured on video allegedly taking bribes to throw cases. Justice Derry, who filed the application for interlocutory injunction in the Kumasi High Court, wants the Kumasi branch of Golden Chilip, Ultimate Radio, and Tiger IPI to be restrained from screening a video in which some 34 judges and about 100 judicial staff and police officers were allegedly caught receiving bribes to pervert justice. The Kumasi-based radio station is running advertisements of Taga IPI, the company of investigative journalist Anas Aramio Anas, which filmed the alleged bribes. Golden Chile, on the other hand, is being advertised as a venue for the screening scheduled for Friday evening, October 2, 2015 and has announced the cancellation of the screening in a post on his Facebook page. And uh, I'll bring that to you in a bit. But the cancellation of the screening of the video has disappointed many in the Garden City. Erasto Cesaradonko has been following developments and joins us now on the line. Good evening to you, Erastos. Good evening. I'm sure you're one of the many residents in Kumasi looking forward to the screening and disappointed that it has been cancelled. How did you hear of the cancellation? Well, I am. Uh, I heard it through uh, social media and radio as well. In fact, it started spreading like wildfire that there's been an injunction placed on the viewing. And so, hoping to cut a glimpse of the video. All right, thank you very much, Erasha Sasaradonko, joining us uh, from Kumasi in the Ashanti region. And I'd like to go straight to Anas's Facebook page to get to see exactly the announcement that he put, uh, posted. Uh, on his page. So it goes, uh, we have been informed of the filing and service of a fresh lawsuit against us and our, all our media partners, Ultimate FM and Selected Venues, Golden Chilip in Kumasi, seeking to stop the screening of the documentary titled Ghana in the Eyes of God in Kumasi. These are interesting days for press freedom and the fight to expose corruption in Ghana. The most powerful tool against corruption is transparency and exposure. Our stand and fight against corruption is a responsibility to the past, the present, and unborn generations. It is about the rights of people, the need to know what happens not only on the streets, but in the highest reaches of power, even our corridors of justice. Let me start by thanking all who have watched or are anxious to watch our uh, latest expose on wrongdoing in this country. Clearly, we have stepped on the toes of some of the most powerful people in our society, the results of which are attempts to stop us from showing this film. I, however, believe that this is temporary. Now, I just want to conclude. And he says, uh, as a journalist and a lawyer, I understand and respect that interpretation and enforcement of the law is a sole preserve of the judiciary. And so I will abide by the law which prohibits me from taking any steps that will prejudice the outcome of the pending injunction application. However, saddened I am at the deliberate attempt to prevent me from serving the public interest which my profession obligates me to through showing you this video. I'm convinced that we must allow due process to drive our actions at all times. And there will be a lot more. In fact, we're going to post this. We're going to be sharing this on our Facebook page. So you can also get to go there and see for yourself exactly uh, what Anas or read the entire post that uh, Anas put up in reaction to the fact that they are unable to show uh, the video or the documentary in Kumasi this evening, in fact, on Friday evening. Meanwhile, the Chief Justice is cautioning judges and lawyers that dishonorable members of the legal profession will face the full rigors of the law. She insists members of the bar and bench engage in serious introspection to find ways of winning back public confidence following recent revelations about widespread corruption in the justice delivery system. Speaking at a ceremony to enroll new lawyers to the bar, the Chief Justice Georgina Theodora Wood said allegations of bribery and corruption in the judiciary have shattered public confidence in the justice delivery system. She admitted that the task of sanitizing the judiciary is a huge responsibility that she cannot achieve all by herself. You are graduating at a time in our legal history when more than ever the perception of the public on the profession is largely negative. 
allegations of bribery and corruption in the judiciary and the legal profession in general is, an, is at an all-time high and confidence, possibly at an all-time low. The Chief Justice charged lawyers to uphold the virtues of the profession by eschewing bribery, corruption and greed. She hinted a commission would soon be set up to swiftly handle allegations of misconduct against lawyers. The council is determined. No dishonorable member of the profession will enjoy immunity or impunity. Beyond waiting to investigate complaints that are lodged with it, we are in the process of setting up an office of an investigative commissioner whose job it will be to proactively actively investigate and process cases of ethical abuse by lawyers and hold them to account to the General Legal Council. Two hundred and nineteen lawyers were inducted into the bar at the ceremony on Friday. Deputy Employment and Labor Relations Minister Baba Jamal is one of the newly inducted lawyers. I mean, when you listen to the speech of the uh, Chief Justice, she has given us a lot of uh, food for thought. All of us are very sad that we are being called to the bar when there is so much uh, uh, embarrassment to the system. But it, it only serves as a challenge to us, those of us who are coming now. We have been trained, we have been given the necessary uh, training to be able to stand up on our own and do things right. Grace Esisaki won the John Mensah Saba Prize for overall best student. You're watching Joy News Prime still to come in the bulletin. We have lots more stories, especially the Ghana Revenue Authority taking on the Voter River Authority for defaulting in its tax obligations. We'll tell you all about it when we come back. We'll tell you all about it when we come back. Stay tuned. It's now time for business, and Abigail Adumaku is here. Good evening to you, Abigail. Good evening, Israel. So it turns out there are a number of stories in there that I'm um, particularly interested in. One of them has to do with the fact that there's a new cocoa producer price. It's going to buy 21%. Right. And then we also have a story about the euro bond. Because mm -hmm. there was so much you know, back and forth. We're not sure what exactly yeah. is, you know, was happening to the euro bond because they said they had completed the process. And then... The most exciting for me is the fact that I know, Google, right? Google is planning to roll lot. out internet. <laughs> yeah. internet. I mean, I can imagine it's going to be some really fast internet. That's a beautiful recap you've done for me there. Well, I'll just give oh. viewers the details <laughs> right away. And we start with, of course, the cocoa price um, being increased by 21%. And government has increased the price at which it will purchase a ton of cocoa farm farmers by 21%. The adjustment will now see a ton of cocoa sold at 6000 1,720 Ghana cities from 5,520 Ghana cities, while a 64 kilo bag of, well, of cocoa will be sold at 420 Ghana cities. The increase can be attributed to favorable prices of cocoa on the international market. If farmers are being paid better in Ghana, why will any farmer go and sell uh, their cocoa to in Cote d'Ivoire where the price is lower? So this is also a motivation to ensure that our farmers sell their cocoa to Ghana, uh, Ghana cocoa. If you remember, last year between um, December 2014 and February 2015, we had a very severe hamatan. So so the small cocoa pods could not mature into the big pods. This is one of the main reasons why our, uh, we couldn't meet our projection. 
That should be some good news for cocoa farmers. Away from that to the Eurobond government says it had to extend the period for the Eurobond issue because of the rising yields on previous U.S. dollar bond issued. The finance ministry in a statement earlier today indicated that it had entered engagements with investors on September 30. There have, however, been speculations that the whole exercise has been suspended. But the deputy minister of finance, Casey Latoforsen, says that is not the case. Unfortunately, at the time we announced the roadshow, the Ghana 2023 and the Ghana 2026 uh, was trading, trading at the secondary market at around 9%. This moved at the time we closed the roadshow to about 11%. Are you in a position to issue at that time to benefit the country? Obviously no. You ask yourself when you open the books and that is what we are doing. So it's about being a standing, but not being saying that um, 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 there are two different things that you have uh, we've held back. That is the announcement language, and that is the strategy the government adopted. Will you launch when market spreads are loosening, or you will launch when, when, when the spread are, are, are tightening? Basic question. You always launch when the opportunity provides itself and the country is going to benefit. A related development, um, outgoing group chief executive of Ecobank, Albert Asien, has reiterated the need for government to negotiate a good interest rate on the 1.5 billion US dollar euro bond government is hoping to raise to stabilize the city. He maintains it will be a pointless or it will be pointless to go for a loan whose interest will throw the economy off balance. I think it's not easy raising funds at certain prices uh, at this point in time, especially for an emerging market. Uh, you know that people expect uh, U.S. Uh, uh, interest rates to go up. Definitely that's a stronger economy. So there is uh, capital flight uh, towards the U.S. Uh, our economy uh, has come under some stress. So definitely in terms of a risk profile, uh, and also looking at the rating, uh, I think one rating agency uh, rated as uh, uh, B still. Still in the junk Yeah, uh, I don't know whether it's the junk status. Well, uh, but but uh, we're rated at least B or so uh, uh, with a negative outlook, if I'm right, which means that it heightens the risk profile of the country. So uh, in going out to raise funding, we need to make sure that we get a much subdued and better uh, interest rate or pricing. And I guess that is what the economic operators would want to have. So for you? I am sure there will be interests. There's always an interest for fundraising. Price is always an issue. I mean, if you are prepared to accept a higher price, I'm sure you have more people actually coming in to take uh, uh, the, the bond. Don't forget, uh, if people perceive risk to be high, they would want to be rewarded accordingly. Now onto something I'm actually excited about. Google has launched an initiative expected to boost internet service in the country. The company is expanding its project link to Ghana with a 1,200 kilometer metro fiber through Accra, Tema and Kumasi. This makes Ghana the second country after Uganda. Google's project link will enable internet service providers, ISPs and mobile operators to provide faster and more reliable internet to customers at lower costs. This is expected to boost internet connectivity in Ghana. We're building this metro fiber network to enable the mobile operators and ISPs to serve their customers. Instead of everyone trying to build their own network, which is very expensive and, and difficult to do, you can build an infrastructure that can be shared across all the operators, reducing their capex and operating costs and allowing them to bring reliable, fast internet and affordable internet to the end users. We're going to have our first customer, uh, a mobile operator or ISP, go live at the end of the first quarter of 2016. With a deepening internet penetration in Ghana, the initiative is welcoming for government and businesses at large. Very exciting for us is the news about Tema uh, fiber rollout and Kumasi. So these are cities that we've not actually grown that very much in terms of our fiber ring. So it's an opportunity for us to expand our fiber ring and ex expand our reach to the last mile. 
According to the Director of Access Strategy of Google, Larry Alder, the initiative should save businesses millions of cities incurred as cost as a result of lack of internet connectivity. Internet is crucial for today's businesses. Uh, we've seen it in deployments we've done in other countries such as Uganda. We've had not only uh, operators like 4G operators in Uganda, we've had new entrants come in. They offer 4G services and even small businesses will use the dongles uh, that they can get, the MiFi devices to improve their services. And some businesses, the larger businesses, will get the fiber taken directly to their premise. While Project Link is for dense urban cities, Google has also developed Project Loon, which uses a global network of high altitude balloons to connect people in rural and remote areas with no internet access. A Kenyan man has been charged with 12 offenses, including rape, impersonating a gynecologist, and operating a clinic without a license in Nairobi. Mugo Wa Wairimu pleaded not guilty and has previously denied that he raped his patients after sedating them. The charges stem from a Kenyan TV report, which had footage showing an unidentified man allegedly assaulting an unconscious woman on a clinic bed. Kenya's Medical Practitioners Board has said he is not a registered doctor. Mr. Wa Wairimu went on the run for a week after the report was aired on Kenya's private citizen TV. He was eventually arrested at a hotel outside the capital Nairobi after members of the public called the police. General Gilbert Dendre, the leader of last month's short-lived coup in Burkina Faso, is in the custody of the country's security forces. Some reports suggest he earlier surrendered at an unnamed diplomatic mission in the capital Ouagadougou. Interim President Michel Cafando was reinstated last week after intervention from the Army and West African leaders. The Presidential Guards unit that carried out the coup is to be disbanded. The general had earlier taken refuge at the residence of the Vatican's representative in Burkina Faso. Details of his reported surrender are still unclear. The financial assets of General Diendre and another 13 people suspected of involvement in the coup were frozen last week. And I'll be all for international news. In other news, a meeting between the Employment and Labour Ministry and representatives of striking psychiatric nurses to get them to return to work has ended in a deadlock. The meeting, which was expected to update the nurses on measures taken by government in relation to the delay in release of their salaries and also to get them to return to work, were failed to materialize. This is the second time this year that nurses at the psychiatric hospital have embarked on a strike. The nurses declared a sit-down strike on August 3 to demand that the employers pay them all their salaries, which have been in arrears for 10 months. Employment and Labor Relations Minister Harun Edrisu subsequently moved in to assure the nurses that their salaries will be paid in two months. According to the nurses, the September deadline promised has not been honored, hence the renewal of the strike. The Labor and Employment Minister Harun Edrisu, who believes the nurses' actions are unacceptable, asked them to resume work while government takes measures to resolve their grievances. This directive has however fallen on deaf ears as the nurses have refused to back down. Those invited into Friday's meeting re echoed the stance, prompting the Employment and Labor Relations Minister to storm out of the meeting. Representatives of the striking nurses, who later came, will not disclose what has transpired in the meeting except to say they will give the feedback to their members we are just on our way to the hospital you know we just finished you can see all the leaders are almost here so let's go back to the hospital we'll talk to our people so what message exactly are you taking to your members from this meeting the message is we'll get there we'll meet our people they'll get the media to be away we've already met the minister we respect him a lot he has done a lot for us we are going to meet our people Whatever transpires, we'll get back and we'll let the whole Ghana know. They, however, maintain nothing will make them return to work unless they see the salaries reflecting in their bank accounts. Matilda Pamagam for Joy News. 
Now, doctors at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital say it may take up to a year for a toddler whose fingers were allegedly burned by a couple in Kumasi to fully recover from the wound. The two-year-old boy is said to have been burned with an iron by his caretakers as punishment for eating out. JFM Super Morning Show host Kojo Yankson visited the community where the alleged abuse occurred in father's report. So this is the young man. Yes. Hello. Hello. Oh. Is he in a lot of pain? Yeah, as you can see. Hmm. So tell me, since the surgery, how has he been? After the surgery, he has been okay, but there is a little bit of pain. Because after the surgery, you must expect some pain. But he's been on some pain medication and analgesis, so I think we are trying to manage the pain. How long do you think it will take for such an injury to heal? It depends. It depends. And once he's a child, yeah, it will heal. But it will take some time. Are we looking at months or weeks or years? Months. Yeah, months. And after the surgery, we've not opened the wound. The wound has not yet been opened. So now I can't even tell you the state of the wound right now because he went to theater on the 28th. So we are yet to open the wound. Such a lovely young boy. Oh, yes. He's only two years old, still not yet speaking properly, but very, very able to communicate. He's so adorable. It's, it's difficult for me to imagine a grown-up looking at such a, a delightful little child and causing him harm. Somebody did this deliberately, on purpose. The police are investigating. We'll know more. In fact, from here, that's my next stop. I need to know what the police have learned so far. On the 22nd of September this year, the police had information that um, a child of two years who had uh, injuries on the hand was brought to the Confanache emergency ward. So police proceeded to the ward to inquire about the cause of the injury. So the guardian, Rita, Madam Rita Oti Odru, said the boy fell into hot water which she was about to use to bath it. So police were not uh, comfortable with the explanation she gave because the informant alleged police that the woman used a, a hot iron to press the hand of the victim for accepting food from a neighbor. So Doc, we've met lovely Samuel and you're the man who took care of him. Can you tell us about the nature of his injuries when he first came in? Well, I mean, it's a teamwork. I, I wasn't uh, exactly the surgeon but I'm in charge of the plastic surgery department. Um, this is a chap who actually came in with burn injuries that had been sustained um, in the village and they had actually taken care of him earlier on, but was referred here because of the uh, wound getting infected. Normally, um, for our own clinical assessment, if a patient is going to put um, his or her hand in the hot water or in any hot object, the natural reflex reaction is such that you move away as quickly as possible. When the burn is such extensive and it goes so deeply to affect the blood vessels, the tendons, and even for the bone to die, then it tells you that the period of contact between the source of the heat, that's the burn, and then the soft tissue was longer than normal. What happened to the boy? He dipped his hand into hot water. 
And how did that happen? I had prepared him for a bath, but I had to attend to the other boy, whom I had just finished bathing. I heard a loud scream. When I ran to the scene, I saw him with his hand in the hot water. So his hand was in the hot water for that long? No, not at all. I rushed there just when he put his hand in the water. Now, the doctors told me that whatever bent him bent all the way to the bone. So if it is hot water that bent him, then his hand was definitely in for long. When I rushed after hearing the scream, his hand was in the hot water, so I picked him up immediately. You're watching Joy News Prime, and certainly we'll be bringing you a lot more on this story as and when uh, it becomes available. But there are lots more stories that you can find on uh, at myjoyonline.com if you get to the page right now. Uh, some of the stories we have, public sector workers to receive 10% pay rides, minimum wage up, uh, COP21 Paris, Ghana will need $22.6 billion. And the, the story about the government increasing the producer price, uh, going up by 21% is also available. But I'd like to share a bit more on the story about the public sector workers to receive 10% pay rise. Uh, so the story goes, the country's minimum wage has been increased from seven cities to eight cities. It represents a 14.3 percent increase and will take effect in January 2016. That's according to the Labor and Employment Minister Harunai Agriisu. There's also a 10 percent hike in public sector salaries, which will also take effect same date. You can get to my join online and get to read a lot more on those stories. We're taking a break now. When we come back, we bring you entertainment with Miss G. Please stay tuned. Right, it's time for entertainment, and you know who's going to be here to deliver. Miss G, good evening to you, Miss G. Easy. Um, those earrings look South African, actually. Okay, some people say they look Kenyan. I don't know. Okay. But, but I, I, I know it was got from Kenya, though. It came from Kenya? Yes, yes. All right, all right. So let's <laughs> get on to uh, entertainment. All right. Nilante, mm -hmm. I, I met that guy. I think he's a really cool guy. Very refined guy. He's actually a doctor. Yeah, you know he's that? a medical doctor at the state <laughs> hospital. Yes, Who's got into music? It's, you it's, know, a, bit, he, it's a bit I, weird. I spoke to him some time back and he told me the fact that he always knew he would do music. And uh, it was just that his parents wanted him to find a profession, you know, a very well-defined profession. That's how come he decided to study medicine that he knew that he would definitely do music. But, you know, he's been talking about okay. what he tends to be hypocrisy in, uh, with gospel, uh, sorry, with reggae musicians in Ghana. He says that though Ghanaians love reggae, you know, they kind of have a perception that almost every reggae musician smokes marijuana, which is not true. Including him. Uh, you know, and he's getting him upset. Let's hear him talk. In Ghana, I think reggae is loved. But there's a certain hypocrisy about it, you know, because of the, you know, the stereotyping um, of, of the music. People tend to attach um, reggae music to, or people always tend to associate reg reggae music with smoking of marijuana and, and the religion, Rastafarianism. But reggae is bigger than all that now. I mean, now Christian musicians are doing reggae and I mean, <laughs> some of the biggest reggae stars in the world are Muslims. I mean, so um, reggae is bigger than the religion Rastafari, and, you know. And as for the marijuana issue, I mean, I mean, musicians from all kinds of genres, you know, use marijuana. It's not only musicians. I know all sorts of artists, um, certain professionals, and 
I mean, it's it's now now we are even beginning to use it in the medical you know domain as well. So. I mean, um, I think that as time passes on, as certain conceptions and certain perceptions will, 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 will be clarified. And to him, I like to say conscious. Risk, <laughs> respect. Respect. You know, but everybody talks about his cover of uh, Ed Sheeran's music, thinking out loud. It's... it's you know, you need to, oh, yeah. to listen to that. I need to yes. listen. I need to listen to yes, that. you need to. Right. But you know, yesterday you talked about crumbs and flavor, the fact that the song won and you know, you wanted to... Yeah, you know. I mean, for, for me, it sounds... Uh, I'm curious. I'm thinking that it probably means something. And the musicians are fond of doing that. Yes, he says it means something, but you need to take a good listen to the lyrics of the song to know what it actually means. So, yes, crumbs and flavor, talking about the education behind won and you know. Okay. Uh, that they don't allow people to be free, so it's you are under bondage, and so you're freeing yourself from some it's bondage. Not just us, but I feel like people sometimes, you know, they feel like uh, you can dance. Okay, so you're actually hoping that they were going to play uh, the part where uh, you talk, but they they're not getting that one. Uh -huh. uh, okay, but. That, that's not all from uh, Crimson. That's not all from them because Flavor tells me that before he decided to take music seriously, he was doing comedy. And so I said to him, who is your favorite comedian here in Ghana? He says a jackal. That's it for entertainment, but when we have sports also coming up, please stay tuned. Alright, it's time for sports, except there's no Gary asked me to bring you the sports, so I'm going to handle the sports all by myself. And this week, it was a seminal one for the Ghana Football Association because the executive committee elections were held. Some very big names were shocked because they did not get the vote of delegates. In reaction to that, Winfred Osekwuku has expressed surprise at the exit of senior members from the executive committee. Very much surprised, particularly when I urged the two of them to... Uh, come for it and get elected, and it turned out to be the opposite. It will, it will baffle you, but uh, having spoken to them, what they've done is to give me encouragement to uh, move on, and whatever support that they will have, uh, whenever I, I consult them, they will give it to me. Mind you, these are experienced members of the ESCO, and uh, hesitating at this point would definitely affect uh, some of us that we had mentored them. And uh, I must say that it's not going to be that easy. But at any point in time, parting company of any kind is quite a sad moment. That is why we weep when people die. Or when people are traveling, we weep when we, are, we were kids. Uh, we have to part company at a given point, but how we can pick ourselves up and ensure that uh, we are able to evolve policies that will direct football and make sure that Ghana football is developed up to the highest level. That is the most important or principal factor now. And that will be all for sports. Right, that's it for the bulletin. Thank you very much for watching. Before we go quick round through our top stories, residents of Komenda in the central region have been left terrified after two persons sustained gunshot wounds in a chieftaincy clash in the town. The Kumasi screening of the documentary involving judges in I wish you a good night and a lovely weekend. Time now for my selfie with Efwa. <laughs> Great. Have a good night. Good night. This is Joy News Prime.